Take it away, Ali. Thanks for the introduction, Stacy, and good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Ali, as mentioned, and I'm the occupational therapist at the Pain Management Center. And I will be giving a talk um, on occupational therapy, defining what it is, exploring some of the science, um, underlying chronic pain and underlying OT treatments that I use with patients to help um, those living with chronic pain. I have no relevant personal or financial disclosures. However, I did want to acknowledge that as an occupational therapist, I have a specific lens that I bring. Um, I chose to get trained as an occupational therapist because I believe in um, the power of what we do every day to support our health and well being. Uh, I was trained in non pharmacologic management of pain, so I don't have a lot of experience with medications or other pharmacologic procedures, although recognize that they can be a part of. Uh, multidisciplinary pain treatment. So just wanted to acknowledge that that's the training I bring in for today. That's kind of my, my perspective and my lens in working with people. Um, this is just to me, my thought was kind of funny. Uh, you actually know what OT is? Do we just become best friends? And I put this here because I think OT is not super well known. Um, I like to joke that we have a marketing problem. And I think part of that is just because what we do with people can be so diverse. Everything from working in the NICU, um, helping premature children to work on their feeding, working in assisted livings, helping, helping people um, return to their daily activities, working out in the community and mental health um, settings, really a diverse range of populations and um, practice areas that we work in. And really our goal is to help you to do what you want to do and need to do I think there's a lot of misconceptions about occupation, meaning your work. And while we certainly can help people return to meaningful work, knowing that that's an important thing that we all do, um, that we do, uh, occupational really refers more to how you occupy your time and exploring the ways in which you occupy your time and how does that impact on your health and being. So here's a quick overview, bird's eye uh, view of the presentation. So. Defining occupational therapy, um, the definition and incidence of chronic pain, which I know um, uh, is quite common to be presented in these lectures, but just go over some of those statistics. And um, we're gonna explore the foundations of pain neuroscience. And I like to dive into this just because I think it helps to explain why I use some of the OT interventions that I use, and then discuss occupational engagement as part of a chronic pain treatment. So again, what is occupational therapy? Um, it is the therapeutic use of everyday life occupations with persons, groups, or populations with the goal of enhancing or enabling participation. Um, and what are occupations? They are the everyday activities that people do as individuals in families and with communities to occupy time and bring mean, meaning and purpose to life. Occupations include things people want to do people need to, want to, or are expected to do. And I like to, again, as I mentioned just a slide ago, go over these definitions because I think that when we talk about occupation, it does often get conflated with profession, but really it can be anything that you do um, day to day um, that's meaningful and purposeful. And so that really you know, opens the door to cooking, knitting, gardening, um, going for a hike, going to church, all of these things can be an important part of someone's occupational, um, occupational life. So again, here are some more examples, um, really breaking it down into different categories. So activities of daily living, those are kind of your basic self-care, bathing, dressing, really think about getting ready for the day. Instrumental activities of daily living, so running errands, managing your money, cooking, laundry, um, health management, so that might be implementing recommendations from your care team, such as exercise, um, dietary choices, things like that, education, again, work, um, play and leisure activities, hobbies, things that you do with your community, and then rest and sleep. Now, segueing a bit, um, talking about pain. Um, and I like to acknowledge right, that, that pain and, and what we do day to day are often interrelated and that pain can make it really hard to do things that you want to do or need to do. Um, or there may be things that you feel like you're expected to do or you need to do that seem to increase your pain. So knowing that this can be a really um, cyclical relationship for some people. 
but pain is defined as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. And that's from the International Association for the Study of Pain. And then chronic pain specifically, um, pain that lasts more than three months. It's often associated with other symptoms, fatigue, um, changes in your mood, um, changes in the, the activities that you do day to day, changes in behavior. Um, it does have a substantial financial impact both um, on individuals and across the country as well. And um, 860 billion a year in both direct and indirect costs. Um, so direct costs in terms of um, providing care, seeking care, and also uh, indirect costs in terms of loss of productivity. Um, in 2016, about 20.4% 20 of US adults had chronic pain and 8% had high impact chronic pain, which was defined as pain that impacts your ability to carry out your daily activities or occupations on a regular basis. Um, and I also wanna acknowledge that there are significant demographic disparities. Um, that could probably be a whole talk in and of itself, um, but women, um, people of lower SES status, um, there's, there's different demographic groups that are more likely to have pain, and that's important to acknowledge. So conceptualizing pain. Uh, I think the biopsychosocial model is very common um, to speak about when conceptualizing pain and all of the different impacts and factors that play a role. Um, I chose to include the biopsychosocial spiritual model because I think that um, it's important to acknowledge that for those people that do have a spiritual spiritual beliefs um, or religious affiliation, that can play an important role as well. And then I overlaid on top of this, um, being an OT nerd that I am, uh, I looked at our practice framework, which really just provides guidance for occupational therapists on what are the things that we should be considering when we're working with our patients. And I think that those things, um, pair nicely with the biopsychosocial spiritual model. So when we look at biological um, inputs to pain, right? What are your body, body structures, motor functions, demographics, genetics, health conditions, um, social considering um, support and relationships, culture, the built environment that you live in. If you're getting recommendations for exercise and yet there's nowhere to go to exercise near your house, you don't have access to a gym, or I know a common recommendation might be pool therapy, and there's no pool nearby that you can access, the built environment can have a direct uh, impact on your ability to carry out these recommendations, carry out these occupations. occupations. Um, psychological, uh, you might consider right, habits and routines, personal factors, personality, coping styles, and then spiritual. So what are your values? What are your beliefs? What are those rituals that are important to you and that guide how you structure your days? And, um, and again, right, uh, if I haven't hit, hit the hammer, you know, guys over the head with a hammer too much before, really looking at how all of these things play a role in what you might choose to do, how you choose to occupy. I wanted to spend a little bit of time delving into some pain neuroscience. Um, now, if you guys aren't familiar with this term, it's really just exploring when you have pain, what is happening in your body when you have pain. And the research shows that um, when people understand what's going on, it can actually be really helpful um, in the management and treatment of pain. And I think whenever I make recommendations to patients, I always want to make sure that they really understand why I'm making that recommendation, where I'm coming from, what the science says. So that's why I thought it was important to uh, start today um, with some pain neuroscience before diving into more of the OT specific treatment. And whenever we're talking about pain and pain neuroscience, we're talking about the nervous system. And that is made up of the peripheral nerves, as you can see, exiting out through the spinal cord they run throughout your body carrying a variety of information. Some of them go to your muscles and carry motor commands that allow you to move. Some of them go to your skin, allowing you to feel touch, different sensations, so really important. And then your spinal cord and your brain. 
Um, your peripheral nervous system is made up of all those peripheral nerves, and then your central nervous system is both your brain and your spinal cord together. So there are those two components. And again, um, kind of overview some of the things I mentioned on the previous slide. But when we look at your peripheral nervous system, so again, all of those nerves that are exiting out um, from your spinal cord to your body, there's a couple different branches. There's the somatic branch or your voluntary nervous system, um, which is go, nerves that go to your skeletal muscles. Again, like I mentioned, that allow you to move. I ask, you know, tell my hand, please pick up this water bottle. It does so um, voluntarily because of the command that I have sent to my hand to coordinate that action. Um, then there's the autonomic branch of the nervous system, which sounds like what it is, more automatic, going to the smooth muscles of say your digestive system, your heart, um, those muscles that contract without us really telling them to. And it's a blessing, right? That we don't have to direct our digestion or direct our heartbeat. Otherwise we would spend all of our time trying to uh, control the internal dynamic of our bodies, um, goes to blood vessels. And then within the autonomic branch, there's sympathetic and parasympathetic activation. And sympathetic might uh, be more commonly known as fight or flight, while parasympathetic might be more commonly known as rest or digest. And typically, we live in a parasympathetic state. Um, so I like to make the analogy of, of a car. And typically, your parasympathetic nervous system would be driving that car, um, helping with repair tasks around the body, you're in a state of, you know, just general equilibrium, making sure everything is going well, doing, you know, anything that, um, you know, heart rate's lowered, you're in that, right, relaxed state. And then if there's a stressful situation, say your car is on ice or um, stuck in stop and go traffic, then your parasympathetic nervous system hands the wheel over to the sympathetic nervous system, your fight or flight response. Um, and that's when we're responding to an acute stress. So you might see your blood pressure increase, um, increase blood flow away from your organs to your skeletal muscles to allow you to respond more quickly to any immediate threat or danger. Um, now, as I'm sure many of you are aware, in our modern day lifestyle, there are a lot more chronic stressors than say acute stressors. Um, and certainly acknowledging that persistent pain is a chronic stressor. And so living more in a sympathetic nervous system activation space is not uncommon for people with persistent pain. Um, so when we have, right, this is kind of a, this is again, an overview of um, how pain processing works. So signals or inputs from the body will travel via the peripheral nerves to the central nervous system, your spinal cord and your brain. The central nervous system will then evaluate that information and send a response back out to the body. And we'll dive a little bit more deeply into what exactly goes on in each of these steps. About 10% of your peripheral nerves are what are called nociceptors, which are free nerve endings that are located throughout the body, and they are an integral part of the body's threat detection system. Um, they might be activated by temperature changes, so extreme heat or extreme cold, mechanical changes, so um, pressure, um, cut, pinch, things like that, and chemical changes. Um, common example is like eating a spicy food, um, capsaicin is a chemical um, that can trigger the pain response. Importantly, no susceptive signals are neither sufficient nor necessary for pain to occur. And we'll be diving a little bit more into why that happens. Um, but our bodies are almost constantly sending no susceptive signals um, and they need to hit a certain threshold for pain to occur. So something that can happen with persistent pain is the phenomenon called peripheral sensitization or primary hyperalgesia. Um, our nervous system and nerves are built up of neurons, which have a baseline resting potential and an all or nothing threshold. So what does that actually mean? So 
each neuron communicates with each other neuron through uh, action potentials through chemicals, like a little messenger they send across. And for a neuron to fire, to communicate with its neighbor, the threshold coming in needs to meet a certain, needs to be of a certain strength. So as you can see here, um, there are right sub threshold stimuli. Basically, the neuron doesn't fire just 25% or just 50%. It doesn't fire at all. But once it reached the threshold, once it reached the reaches, the stimulus reaches the threshold, it will signal that neuron to fire to communicate with its neighbors. Um, and then again, even if there's more stimulus than necessary to trigger that threshold, the neuron doesn't fire more. It still just fires that same amount. Um, and with persistent pain at times, you might see changes from the baseline threshold, either due to increased sensitivity of those nociceptors, or there might be uh, new nociceptors, new receptors that are created in that area. Um, and this makes sense within an acute injury. Um, say you had a recent surgery, right? You might be more sensitive to touch in that area. You might be more sensitive to movement. Um, and the body will increase that sensitivity to allow that site to heal. Um, however, when pain persists for a long time, um, that increased sensitivity might remain and make it harder to, again, move, to tolerate touch, things like that in that area. Something that's really important to know, though, is that sensitivity is dynamic and it's constantly changing. Um, these nociceptors don't have a very long life. It's only a few days. and so. Sensitivity can change um, in one direction or another fairly quickly. So now that we've talked about nociceptors, so say you touch a hot pan, right? You hit that threshold for the nociceptor to fire. It sends a signal up your peripheral nerve and it reaches your spinal cord. Um, your spinal cord is a really important place, and I kind of like to conceptualize it as a volume knob, either turning the volume up or down on sensations coming in from the body. Um, so this is where both information coming from the body and information coming from the brain um, meet and are integrated. And I, again, probably could spend a whole talk talking about the spinal cord and all of the really unique functions that come with it. Um, but one important theory to mention is what's called the gate control theory. And that was uh, hypothesized by Ronald Melzack and Patrick Wall back in the 1960s. And they looked at the spinal cord as, as this gate um, that could control, help modulate and influence um, pain levels based on both the information coming from the body and from, from uh, descending information from the brain. Um, so an example of that might be, again, you touch that hot pan, the nociceptive signals fire off, information gets to the spinal cord, triggering actually a reflex. You remove your hand from that pan almost without thinking about it because of a reflex triggered at the spinal cord. And then you might unconsciously rub that area or shake that area when you shake your hand out. And that's because you are trying to activate different pathways that also come to the spinal cord that can actually dampen signals coming from the body. And so that's where things like self-massage, um, movement even, some of acupuncture, some of these um, non-pharmacologic pain strategies have been shown to actually activate a different type of, of nerve in our bodies that can help modulate those nociceptive signals. And then also you get uh, information and signals from the brain. So you might have heard of right, our internal medicine cabinet, um, things like dopamine and endorphins that are released when we are having fun, when we're doing something meaningful, when we're concentrating um, on, a, on a meaningful task, when we're exercising, things like that. Um, it releases neurotransmitters or these chemical signals that can have a powerful impact on modulating or um, influencing that pain response. Uh, and then we arrive at the brain. Um, so those, right, you touch the hot pan, signals have fired off to the spinal cord, where then they fire off to the brain. And then they go to actually a widely distributed neural network throughout the brain, including sensory motor regions. So your brain is working to locate where it is that signal actually coming from 
in your body. Um, emotional or affective regions. So what emotions do you currently have? What emotions does this sensation trigger? Um, cognitive regions. So what is your thought around the pain? Do you, are you, or the sen sensation? Um, does it feel like something that's manageable, controllable, something that you can withdraw from? Or is it something that feels out of control, something that you're not sure you can affect at all? Um, and then modulatory regions, which are those this, um, your brain's ability to um, send signals down to your spinal cord to tamp down the nociceptive signals coming from the body. Um, and this is actually coming from research from Dr. Mackey, one of the, the um, doctors here at the pain clinic. And I thought it was a really nice image showing this widely distributed network of areas that are involved in responding to pain throughout the brain. Um, so again, we see um, areas that encode intensity of the pain, um, areas that locate pain in the body. Um, what are any memories you have that are associated with it? So again, do you remember, right? I've touched a hot pan before and I know that it hurts. Um, what are the um, emotions that this sensation is triggering? Um, and there can be changes in this network and in these areas for, between acute and more persistent pain. Uh, this phrase pain neurotags is from a, um, or I was familiar or introduced to it uh, by a physical therapist out of Australia named Vormer mostly. And it's this idea, again, as we were looking at that map, that neural network in the brain, that different areas in the brain can, um, associate basically that again if you touch a hot pan you will have a memory of oh i've done this in the past it brings up certain emotions and that all of these things can become be brought into relationship with one another um or for someone who has had increased pain and now they're having difficulty with hiking and it feels like every time they go for a hike it brings about certain emotions and it seems to also always be associated with pain. And so it's this idea that there's increased sensitivity in the pain network to fire under specific circumstances or with specific environments, specific tasks, things like that. The other thing I wanted to mention is the power of attention. Um, when we look at the uh, map, inside of our brain, we see a couple areas that are really associated with um, our ability to attend to what's going on around us, our ability to focus our attention on specific things. Um, and attention across a multitude of studies has been shown to alter activity in the pain network. Um, and it almost doesn't, many different activities do this albeit in slightly different ways, but thinking about a loved one, focusing on a different sensory input, engaging in a meaningful activity or a cognitively demanding task, all of these things can alter that activity and the brain network because our attention is focused elsewhere. And I have had a lot of people that I work with mention, um, oh, when I am distracted, my pain isn't, isn't as high or when I'm doing this thing that I really enjoy, I forget about my pain for a while, or I don't notice it as much. Um, and that's because of that alteration in the pain network. Um, there was a study done in the 1980s that found an increase in pain threshold when participants were engaged in a purposeful versus non-purposeful activity. So when we feel like, again, there's meaning, there's purpose to what we're doing, we're actually physiologically changing how our body is responding to pain. And I just think that is um, so important to understand. So now moving more into OT treatment. Um, again, Dr. Vivian Topic is another of the pain doctors here. And I was reading an article and I found this quote from her and I thought that it just encapsulated Stanford's approach to pain management so well. Pain is hundreds of different things and we've learned that's, that that's how we must treat it. 
So again, um, zooming out with my OT lens, this is how I might approach the treatment of pain. And when I'm meeting someone for the first time, when I'm working with them, these are some of the things that I try and understand. So what do their occupations look like on a day-to-day -day basis? What context, you know, what is their home environment? What is their work environment? What are their habits, their routines? What roles are important to people? Um, are they a mom? Are they a father? Are they a coworker? Are they a friend? Are they a daughter? What are those things, those roles that, that play a meaningful role in their life? Um, motor skills. So um, that might be you ha have more pain when you reach up overhead or when you're biking or when you bend down. What so what are the what are the ways that you you're moving throughout your day? What are the ways that you're using your body um, to engage in those things that are important? Um, and then values, beliefs, and spirituality, body functions, body structures. So really trying to take a deep view of all of these things. Um, so what what we do? Why is what we what we do important? Um, Pain often impacts our behaviors. Uh, pain is intended to be a danger signal from the brain um, to grab our attention and say, hey, something's going on. Now we know as pain persists that it becomes really hard to parse out, well, what is going on when I have this pain? Um, and that's where um, working with a multidisciplinary team is so helpful but really acknowledging that pain often impacts behavior um, in many different ways, right? Uh, it's not always that pain impacts our behavior in a way where we, um, that you might perceive as more loss, right? Sometimes pain will get someone, you know, I've had patients who are like, well, now I'm slowing down or now I've decided to switch this thing and I'm really more happy with what I'm doing now. Um, so it, it can go in many different directions, um, but there can be that cyclical relationship. And what our behavior, as I, I hope I've been able to explore a little bit in that bird's eye view of pain neuroscience, is that what we do is important. It has a physiological impact. It can have an emotional impact, a cognitive impact. Um, all of these things. Um, I remember reading that there is some research out there looking at, you know, are our beliefs more predictive of our behavior or behavior more predictive of our beliefs? And some research out there shows that actually when we behave in a way that is incongruent with our beliefs, we're much more likely to change our belief than to change our behavior. Um, and I think that that can be used as a tool. So when I am not feeling like exercising or I might not feel like, um, getting off the couch and going out to coffee with a friend, but I do it anyway, I'm showing myself through my behavior that that's an important thing to me, that my community is important, that moving my body is important. Whatever that is, I think just acknowledging that there's science um, and a lot of research looking at the impact of our behavior. Um, and then there's a relationship between behavior and clinical outcomes. Um, and again, many different studies exploring um, active um, participation and engagement in um, health management programs from, you know, persistent pain to other chronic conditions, they can have a, you know, active participation can have a significant positive impact on clinical outcomes. Um, so looking at, right, the balance of what we do day to day, so temporal balance. How much are you doing day to day? Um, is it that you're trying to fit in a lot of activity on the day where you have less pain, resulting in that boom bust cycle, um, and then followed by days with less activity? Um, but also, so there's the timing balance, but there's also the activity balance. And I think a lot of people who have pain focus so much on what they need to get done versus what they want to get done. Um, that when pain makes it hard to get everything into a day that you would like to, the hobbies, the things that you did for fun can get left by the wayside um, in um, 
and with a preference for, okay, I need to do my laundry or I need to do um, meal prep or, you know, all of those to-do tasks can pile up. Um, and I hope that through exploring some of the pain neuroscience makes it clear why doing things that we want to do, doing things that we enjoy doing might be beneficial. Um, so again, looking at the balance of your activities, the timing of them, and what types of activities you're engaging in. And then how we do what we do. Um, so bringing awareness and intention, right? Um, I will um, work with people to identify maybe there are some repetitive motions that seem to increase your pain. Um, and so what are the ways that you're moving your body and can we bring more awareness there? Um, and could we make, right, even things as simple as unloading the dishwasher part of your therapeutic activity program or your therapeutic exercise program. Um, lens of self-compassion. Um, so when something is hard, is that, you know, does that make you feel like, oh, I'm a failure, I can't do anything? Um, or is there a way to approach things that are challenging with that lens of self-compassion? What is the environment that you're operating in? Um, and then coping skill deployment. So, you know, on a day where you have less pain, what are your coping skills look like? On a day, you know, maybe an average day or a day with more pain, what does that look like? And so what are your habits and patterns? So say, um, you would like to re-engage, right? There's things that you've stopped doing or you do less of that you'd like to get back to. Um, questions you might choose to ask are, right, what are my values? What are those things that, that guide me? Um, how can I live out my values day to day? What roles are important to me? This one, I found a study looking at role loss in people who have persistent pain. And it found that on average, people lost um, I think just over three roles and roles are those things like coworker, friend, um, sister, brother, um, and people tended to lose more roles in the social, like friendship and work domains than in the family domain, which makes sense. Um, but then within those roles, there was also it, an average of loss of seven attributes. And what that means is maybe in my role as a friend, it allows me to be compassionate or it allows me to be adventurous, um, those attributes that are important. And so really acknowledging that persistent pain can have a significant impact in how you show up in important roles. Um, and so I think using those roles that are important to you to guide what activities you might want to be engage in. Um, if you're a mom, right, going to the playground with your kids or cooking a meal with your kids. If you're a sister, maybe grabbing coffee. Um, so just using those to guide you. And then again, as I mentioned, what do you want to do? Um, not the need to do's, um, not the, you know, must do's, but what actually brings you joy? And I think acknowledging that that can be a very loaded question when you have pain, because it might feel like, even the things that you used to do for fun, you might try them, but they don't feel fun anymore or they just don't feel like an option. Um, and so I really, you know, I recognize that that um, can be really hard to sit with. Um, and maybe there are ways to be flexible and to adapt in how you engage in those things as well. So um, re-engaging in uh, uh, OT school, we're taught that what's called occupational analysis, which sounds very fancy, but it's basically just breaking down an activity into its component parts and then building it back up. Um, so for example, if uh, you really wanted to cook a, uh, a meal, you know, getting very specific, like what kind of meal do you wanna cook? How long does it require you to stand? Does it require you to chop? Is holding a knife hard? Um, really using the amount of time you're engaged, the physical challenge, the emotional response, all of these things are um, variables that you can play with and how you break down an activity. Um, or hiking, maybe your goal is to go on a four mile hike. So considering, right, the length of time, if you're going with someone or by yourself, 
Um, what is the incline? All of these things are things that you can try and use and play with to break down the task of cooking or hiking until it seems like it's manageable. Um, and it's the just right challenge. And so what do we mean by the just right challenge? Um, this is what's called the Twin Peaks model, again, from uh, the physical therapist, Lorimer, Lorimer mostly. And it looks at um, something, that some of those changes that can happen with persistent pain. So, right, the protect by pain response should come a little bit before that tissue tolerance. You don't ever wanna push toward the, past the point of tissue tissue tolerance or tissue damage. And that's where pain, pain can be helpful. Um, sorry. Um, with persistent pain, what we actually we might see though is yes, there is a drop in the tissue tolerance, but the protect by pain response has also dropped. And now there's a bigger gap between the two. And so overlaying the stoplight method um, onto this Twin Peaks model, um, you might look at green as activities or tasks that maybe don't have no pain because you might have constant pain, but they're easy, they're, they're relatively simple. Um, there's no significant increase. Yellow is what I like to call safe but sore. Um, it's more of a challenge. It may be a little bit more uncomfortable, but you're not afraid that you're going to be hurting yourself. It feels manageable. It's the just right challenge. And then red is really where you're pushing past that point of tissue tolerance. And um, our goal is never to push out into that red zone, but to find, hey, what is that yellow? What is that next thing um, that's available? And so these are some of the principles um, that I use in my work with patients. Um, as an OT. Here's um, slide detailing as, um, as Stacy mentioned, uh, some of the additional resources that we have available in our pain clinic. Um, and I, my references are here as well, but I will leave it here on that additional resource page. Mm -hmm.